morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the weekly briefing on the University of Arizona campus reentry. I'm Holly Jensen, Vice President of Communications for the University. Today marks the 13th briefing to discuss the university's reopening. And the great news is we made it. We've had a great start to our first week of classes. Before we get started, if you're interested in asking questions, please enter your name and news organization into the chat, or you can type your questions into the Q&A and I will ask on your behalf. With us today is Dr. Robert C. Robbins, president of the University of Arizona, and Dr. Richard Carmona, 17th Surgeon General and director of our reentry task force. Welcome gentlemen, Dr. Robbins, the floor is yours. Thank you, Holly, and welcome everyone who's tuning in today. Uh, as Holly said, we're excited. We're four days into return to the fall semester here at the University of Arizona. And the good news is the um, trend of cases in the community uh, continues to go down. Uh, they're looking encouraging, and Dr. Carmona will, uh, as he always does every week, uh, go through the case numbers and, and data. Uh, we're, we're, again, very blessed to have a uh, strong working group of our uh, epidemiologists and uh, public health experts that we meet with. Uh, Dr. Carmona uh, has them meet with him through the instant command system uh, every week. And we're, we're closely following uh, the results of uh, data in the community and on campus every day. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, people are incredibly excited about being back to campus, but I have to tell you, campus doesn't look the way it did uh, this time last year. Um, there, there are less people, which I think uh, out and moving about as we uh, have started classes in this um, uh, very gated approach where only those students who have uh, uh, essential courses need to go to those classes. Those are the only uh, students who are in face-to-face -face class activity. And that's about 5,000 students. We estimate there are around 30,000 uh, students that uh, return to the Tucson area. Um, it's an amazing first time, uh, full-time class, and we're happy to have them back. We've set all kinds of numbers for this first time, full-time cohort. More than 43,000 first year applications. That's a 5% increase uh, from last year. Nearly 8,000 transfer applications, which is a 15% increase from last year. And our, our entering uh, class is uh, the most diverse ever. We said that last year, this year, it's even more true. Nearly 30% of the first year students identify as Hispanic or Latinx. And of those, 31% are first-generation college students, which is fantastic. 2,500 transfer students are enrolled. 50% identify as non-white. And there, there are about 900 uh, uh, students who are incoming transfer students who've chosen Arizona Online. Uh, I was talking to Dr. Craig Wilson this morning, and I think our online uh, number of students has grown to over 6,000 now. And the students are doing a great job. I've, I've been out on campus uh, during the day and it's uh, certainly less students, uh, but at night uh, I'm seeing a little more activity. Uh, and I would say based on just my random going around and watching, uh, most people are doing a good job of covering their face. Um, but I, I have seen people that are in groups that are not socially distanced and not covering their face. Um, and that, that's a problem. We've said this over and over and over again. So occasionally I'll roll my window down and say, you know, I've got an extra mask if you forgot yours. And they usually pull it out and put the mask on. Or, you know, I'll say this is really, really important to, to, to stop the spread of this deadly virus. We need to follow the rules. But there have been, uh, uh, Mayor Romero and I had a very, spirited discussion yesterday about the return of students to the campus. And she said, you know, you can control the bubble inside the classrooms and the dorms, but I'm concerned about what happens outside of the classroom and we are too. So we're trying to educate everyone and trying 
to implore them to, to follow the rules. Uh, we, we've had some uh, situations that have been captured on social media about parties that were, uh, that were happening. And in a couple of the nights uh, this week, uh, I think it was uh, Monday, Tuesday, maybe even uh, Wednesday night, uh, there were large gatherings in the uh, sand beach volleyball courts around Coronada. Um, normally that'd be great, good fun, but unfortunately, uh, most of the people there weren't covering their face. So, uh, we, we had to take down the nets and put some fencing around it and ask people, uh, not to congregate there because we, we have to do a good job of not having these big crowds, these off-campus, uh, uh, parties, and, uh, we'll continue to message that and try to, um, to help people understand this is a true public health crisis and an issue. And then for us to have the privilege of continuing to have the university stay open, we have to follow the rules. Frequently, meticulously wash your hands, cover your face, stay as far away from as many people as possible. So uh, we've had a low instance of uh, a number of cases, by and large, our students have been model citizens over the summer because they're coming in uh, negative for the most part. We've had 10,126 total tests administered and only 46 positive. Yesterday, we administered 770 tests and there were nine positives. So we're guardedly uh, optimistic uh, that uh, that we we'll can, can continue in the current mode we have, but we know the incubation time is a couple of weeks. So as we update you every week here, and we do so daily, daily through uh, written and uh, websites and social media, uh, if anything changes, we'll let you know. Exciting news, I think uh, last week was a press conference uh, right before this uh, press briefing where we announced the, um, the launch of the COVID Watch app. Uh, I'm happy to report that over 11,000 uh, individuals had downloaded the app. You can download it at covid.arizona.edu backslash COVID Watch. You'll have to watch the video because I'm not gonna repeat it. But the good thing is that people are, are, are downloading it, they're using it. We have, we've mandated that the wild uh, cat well check uh, uh, is required by everyone. I get mine at eight o'clock every morning. I fill it out. There are three questions there. Uh, we've gotten, uh, I think, 5,200 uh, individuals who are doing that and completing it every day. Um, yesterday, we had 2,970 uh, wellness checks completed. You can, you can uh, download that or go to that website at wellcheck.arizona.edu. And we'll continue to focus as always from the start of these press briefings on our test, trace and treat program. It's the heart of our mitigation efforts. Again, the six things, if you wash your hands, you cover your face, you stay away from people. And, and we do a good job on testing, tracing and isolation and treatment we can get through this uh, without having uh, uh, massive outbreaks and people uh, getting ill. Um, periodic testing in our dorms began this week. Uh, we focused on Lifekin's uh, dorm yesterday. Uh, we've added uh, wastewater epidem based epidemiology to our environmental measures factors. Um, and the new uh, COVID-19 uh, app that we're using along with wastewater uh, based epidemiology, we think differentiates us. I always get, well, how are you different from UNC or how are you different from my, Miami or, or Notre Dame? Well, we are really uh, have Dr. Ian Pepper, who is a world expert on wastewater uh, based epidemiology, and he's been doing a great job with us. Uh, and we have this COVID-19 uh, uh, app. So this system of wastewater-based uh, epidemiology, uh, Rich and I got a, a call night before last to say, Dr. Pepper has picked up uh, a signal uh, in one of the dorms. It turned out to be lichens. We went over, we tested uh, 
uh, all the students and, and, and staff that work there in Likens, and we found two positive cases, which we moved over to isolation. So we think this is going to be a very valuable tool to help us get out in front. And remember what I've always said, I, I think uh, this week I've heard about uh, 11 cases that are positive that were symptomatic that went to, to uh, campus health and they are um, isolating uh, either on or off campus, uh, either at Babcock or, or in their own homes uh, off campus. But we, what we really need to find out are who are the people who are asymptomatic that are positive. So this random testing, this use of uh, wastewater, wastewater based epidemiology is going to be really important, uh, as well as watching the compliance metrics of how many people are covering their face, how many people are downloading the, um, the app for contact tracing, how many people are completing their uh, daily Wildcat wellness check. So we'll, we'll continue to update you and um, and let you know where we are uh, daily. We're watching this, Dr. Carmona and his ICS team, along with our public health uh, uh, advisory team um, are working very, very closely every day uh, to try to continue to watch the data and let that guide how we're, um, how we're operating the campus. So with that, I'm gonna stop. I went a little bit longer than usual because uh, there's so much to talk about, and we're so excited to have uh, as many people as we do back on campus, but we, we have to make sure we follow the rules and, um, and have classes in a uh, gated, slow entry type way. So, Dr. Carmona, can you uh, update us on the data? You bet, sir. Thanks so much, Bobby. Appreciate your passion. Uh, Let's go ahead uh, and uh, we'll continue in week 13 uh, as we've done in the past to uh, all of you who uh, joined us. Thank you again for hanging with us over all these weeks. And uh, what I'd like to do is show you where we are with the data points again, because this is really what's driving the decision making that the president is doing. And our job in ICS is to uh, get all of this good information, uh, both internally and externally, so that the president always is able to make an informed decision as we move ahead day to day. So can I have the first slide, please? So if we look at Arizona cases by day, uh, for quite some time now, we've been leading the nation as uh, cases are dropping. And you can see on that right side of the curve toward the end of uh, August, the number continues to go down. So in a lot of different areas, we've been doing pretty well here in Pima County. Uh, and we'll see those in just a minute. Next slide, please. So declining cases, and you can look where we are with all the states, and you can look at Arizona, they are on the right circle. And you can see, again, a, a continued precipitous drop where we peaked, you know, back a month, over a month ago, and we're continually uh, dropping down. Now. Next slide. So COVID-19 Pima County cases since June 1st. As you can see the ups and downs and the spikes, but what we see toward the right of the slide again, we're starting to stay pretty low all the time and very few cases, very few new cases in Pima County, which is all good. And so again, the reason we're monitoring the city, the county, the state, the United States, and sometimes globally is, is that cases come from all around our country. Our, our students come from all over, people travel. So we need situational awareness of the states around us, the whole United States in general. And as the president has said repeatedly, probably daily, we're on the phone with other universities, under the university leaders, organizations, to find out what's evolving there, crowdsource as much good information as we can, apply it here, so that we're always on the cutting edge of science as it relates to the decision making. Next slide. So deaths again, you can see are down to zero. I think this past week we were at zero. And so uh, we're doing very well, but again, I wanna emphasize as the president does all the time, we will not be complacent. Uh, every morning there is a sense of, sense of urgency with our team in looking at this data and always asking the question, what can we do better? What are we missing? It's what keeps the president and myself and some of our faculty up at night because as hard as we're working and the due diligence we're applying to every decision, there's the sense that there's something that we're not, we're not looking at. Is there another metric? Is there some other test that will help us be better at predicting this? Because remember, 
Nobody saw COVID-19 before December of January behind. So we're six, seven months into this now, and it's still the ball game that's evolving. We learn more about the science every day. We learn more about the epidemiology, which is, as the president said, we're meeting repeatedly every day with scientists, our epidemiology teams, factoring the new science so that we can make the best decisions based on this information. And as we look at this in the future and we look back and we evaluate our data, we'll be able to be better prepared for the future as well. Next slide. ICU beds have been pretty consistent and you can see they're starting to drop a little bit toward the right, that's a good thing. The uh, overlying issue there that we are concerned about is that as the summer is ending, as the snowbirds start moving back, Every year without COVID, we see a bump in hospitalizations. We see a bump in uh, ICU bed use because many of our snowbirds would be uh, high risk as it relates to COVID. And as we go into the flu season, we see that people come here, they do get sick. Uh, they come for the weather. So we're always watching bed availability, ICU bed availability, staffing issues, because we have to make sure that we're able to surge if there's an untoward event on campus that we would need to care for our students, staff, or faculty. And we also have to be aware of the influx of people in uh, the snowbird season and their utilization needs as well. So these are very important numbers that we look at every day. Next slide, please. Ventilators, I've said many times, it's just a surrogate. And as we see ventilator use going down and generally our ventilator use the last few months, about half of them, plus or minus a few percent have been used for COVID patients. But as we see our numbers dropping and we see mortality dropping, we see less ventilators being used as well. So it does tell us we have some capacity to surge if we need to, and that's a good thing. Hopefully we don't have to, but we always have to be planning for the worst case scenario if there are untoward events where critical care or enhanced care is needed. Next slide. This is the, the number that you know, we're most proud of that the president often touts as, as well as I do. This is the, this uh, R naught, which is our level of transmissibility down, still down below one, which is a very, very good number. And you know, something that many states are trying to attain and many communities are trying to attain. So this tells us that our transmissibility is relatively low as long as we keep it below one. So that's why that line is green as long as it's below one. And it's one of many data points that we look at in order to make better informed decisions and give better advice to the president every day so he can make his decision. Next slide, please. So as you know, uh, the, the, the basis of our program is to test all and test smart. The antigen tests, as you know, are being administered on a daily basis to our students as they arrive. And as the president has said, we've uh, you know over 10,000 of those with only 46 positive. But these are the numbers on a daily basis as we've gone along and the total adding up to the, the 10,000, I think 126 and, and very few being positive. So it's interesting that uh, you, we see that most of our students that are arriving actually are arriving pretty healthy and are COVID free. But nevertheless, we have to test to ensure that we don't inadvertently put a student in a dorm with hundreds of others who is positive and then spread the disease. So, so far we've been very successful. Next slide. And the isolation beds in use, as, as the president has pointed out a little bit earlier, we had a uh, total, I think, of about 12 uh, cases that have been positive. And uh, because some of those came from the community, they were able to go off campus to their homes and, uh, and isolate there. And currently we have five in, in the dormitories here that are set aside for quarantine and isolation. And they're doing fine. And we expect that after that quarantine period, they'll return to their normal activities and continue their, their coursework. But while they're there, they're digitally connected and they're not missing any academic interaction. The next slide. I think that'll be the last, there we go. Last one, so Bobby, uh, you know, like you, I'm uh, optimistic, but cautious. I think that the numbers have been good. The students, the faculty and staff have been working very hard for us to be able to maintain the, the level of uh, low transmissibility and health and safety on the campus that you have demanded of all of us. Um, of course, we still are concerned because after all, these are, these are young people who come here not only to be educated, <clears throat> but to stay socially connected. And I think our biggest challenge still remains in trying to inspire these very gifted young men and women who come to the campus to learn, 
that, you know, the, the bro hug and the high five and shoulder to shoulder and sharing lunch. And we can't, we got to do it with spatial, with spatial distancing that's appropriate. And so I think that's our biggest fear. You know, what you mandated for the team early on was get the campus ready. Make sure we bring every best practice in here to make sure that once the students are here, they can be safe. And we've done that. And, you know, with a fantastic team from the facilities from scientists, just everybody pitching in. Now our challenge is controlling those variables that are the tough ones, the, the social behaviors that plague every public health person, whether you're looking at diabetes, whether you're looking at tobacco use, the fact is so these social behaviors are the ones that are plaguing us now. So I think it's worth maybe spending a minute and, and discussing it so that those are watching understand that we are spending a lot of time engaging with students and student groups across the board, faculty, staff, to always make sure we have the best practices in order to educate, inspire, and afford people the opportunity to change behaviors for the privilege of remaining on campus that is disease-free. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Rich. Thanks for going through uh, those data. Um, you know, it's inevitable. Uh, we're gonna have cases. Uh, I'm, I'm actually uh, not surprised that we've had cases. We're gonna have many more. Uh, the numbers are going to get higher, um, and you know the the issue is going to be: Can we handle the the steady flow of cases, or do we get a big spike in cases that overwhelms our ability to isolate and uh, continue to test? But you you hit on the most important point that we've been talking about uh, this whole time: uh, How can you really expect? Um, students to really follow the rules and keep their face covered and not go to parties and uh, stay socially distanced uh, outside the controlled environment that we have. In the dormitories, we can manage that somewhat, but they go down to University Avenue, 4th Street, downtown, and they come back into the uh, dorm. And when they're there, they follow the rules, they cover the face but it's what happens off campus. Uh, and, and that's what uh, Mayor Romero and I, and uh, you know, the county officials, I know you uh, meet with the county health uh, officials and, and we meet together with the city and the county to try to continue to message out, please follow the rules. They're pretty simple rules, really simple rules. Wash your hands, cover your face, stay away from as many people as possible, but we can't, seem to get people to follow the rules. And so consequently, we're gonna see uh, spikes in these cases, but we, we're gonna have to start holding people accountable. If they don't follow the rules, there are consequences and there'll be warnings and they will be referred if they're students through the uh, Dean of Students and the, and the Student Code of Conduct. And there could be, um, uh, individuals who are suspended or even expelled from the university if they continue uh, to not follow the rules, uh, whether that's uh, repeatedly not wearing face coverings in class uh, or whether it's continuing to have big parties uh, off campus, uh, even though they're off campus. So we get into a dicey area about what, where's our jurisdiction and how can we hold people accountable? So, you know, Rich, that's, that's always going to be our challenge throughout the whole, uh, this whole semester. And I would say even the entire year, because this is going to be with us all this year and maybe even to fall semester next year. Yeah, I think you're right. And, um, you know, acutely the challenges as we see these groups that like you, I, I will offer a mask, uh, you know, a gentle persuasion, a big smile. Hey, guys, welcome back. Help us keep the campus safe, you know. And, you know, and, and avoiding any, any you know, uh, harsh words or anything, but, you know, let's all work together. And I think so far, you know, with a few exceptions, it's, it's, it's working pretty well. We've seen kids masked up. We're seeing them keeping social distance. You see a whole lot less high fives and bro hugs. And when they're sitting and eating, they're a few feet apart. So I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously uh, encouraged that they're, they're getting the message. But in support of that, as you know, we also have our health ambassador teams where the School of Nursing, the School of Medicine, College of Public Health, our EMTs on campus, where we have our own EMS service. All of them are being empowered to be influencers in the community, in our campus community, 
to remind the students when they see these infractions and to help us change the culture. Just as we talked about, Bobby, when decades ago, it was okay for everybody to light up a cigarette in a restaurant, in a classroom, on the mall, nobody said anything. Today, it, it is absolutely unacceptable and politically incorrect to light up a cigarette. Why? Because people rose to the occasion and said, no, I won't tolerate that. And so what we're trying to do here is encourage and empower our students to move in that direction that the, the lack of social space, the lack of masking, the lack of sanitation is now socially unacceptable. Every one of us has to do that. And if we do that, we can continue to have the privilege to be at this great university. And the other thing, Bobby, I think that's worth discussing would be that you know the struggles we have had over the last few months and uh, you driving us asking, you know, well, what else do we need? What the questions you always ask, what other tests can we do? How can we identify these risk factors earlier? And this wastewater is really pretty slick, okay? Because who would have ever thought of that, that monitoring the effluent from certain buildings and being able to then detect virus in that effluent before anybody's even sick, before you know it. And that's what happened just recently here where uh, you know Dr. Pepper and his team, as well as our epidemiologists came together and said, we've got a couple of cases. And nobody would have known that otherwise, but with this early detection, we jumped on it right away, tested those youngsters and got them the appropriate, that appropriate uh, isolation where they needed to be. And you think about if we had missed it, if we had waited till they became symptomatic and they stayed in that dorm for days or a week or the whole incubation period, how many other people would have been infected? So I, I think the, 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 this is where our nation and our university does best. When we are stressed, when we are searching you know, for our very survival and innovation then takes over. And so this, uh, you know, going from the PCR test that was taking weeks to an antigen test that takes an hour, and now on the verge of opening up with saliva tests that are instant almost. So the innovation is fantastic here at the university. And I think it's worth maybe the comment what your thoughts are, Bobby, on, 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 on how important the wastewater is as well as an early indicator that helps us to pick cases up before they spread to other people. Yeah, as you know, you know, we, we debate with our epidemiologists, should that be one of our metrics? And we're, we're a little uh, reticent to include it because it's so new and so unproven. But uh, I think just this week, uh, we saw great promise in uh, we, in fact, found cases that um, no one would have known about. And, and, and now we're contact tracing uh, all of their contacts to find out how many other students uh, may be positive and asymptomatic. Because again, that's the big get here. The symptomatic people are going to find their way to a clinic, to um, student health, to a physician. Uh, and they're just not going to feel well. They'll take themselves out of uh, the, the public uh, 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 interactions. But it's the asymptomatics who have no idea that they're going around and infecting people uh, right and left. And that's why there was this interesting study that um, the CDC had about these two, two hairdressers in uh, Missouri, I think, where they, they were, had symptoms but continued to cut hair uh, for eight days. It took eight days for the for the um, results to come back. Both of them were symptomatic. They cut hair side by side. They cut 147 people's hair in, in uh, eight days and zero cases. There was no transmissibility because both the hairdressers and all of their clients wore face coverings the whole time. So that's that, that just shows you um, how important it is, especially for the asymptomatic people who don't know they're symptomatic uh, that are spreading this everywhere. Keep your face covered. It sounds so easy and so simple. We've got to just make it where it's cool to do that. And yeah. it's uncool not to. Uh, well, I, think, I think we're getting cooler because, uh, you know, we've got the nice U of A ones now and people have uh, become very resourceful with all kinds of patterns on it and making fashion statements as well. So I think that that's good. The other thing, Bobby, supporting what you said, CDC recently reported as well that up to 40% of people may be asymptomatic. That's four in 10 that are walking around that you just yep. don't know. Hence, 
why it's important to mask up and bear down every day. Absolutely. So we'll get to questions, Holly. But one last thing I wanted to say, uh, I, I can't thank all of the staff, all of the faculty, all of the students who really pitched in and are giving it a shot at trying to stay safe, take care of each other. Um, but the testing, um, the contact tracing, all of the things that we're doing together has truly been inspirational and uh, phenomenal. So I, I wanted to thank everyone. I mean, just the parents and the students who told me about our testing. Uh, it's been very uh, customer service driven. People haven't had to wait for a long time. They're getting their results back. And I know it's, you know, it's imposing to ask people for additional tests, but it's the only way that we can find those asymptomatic positive cases. So please, if we are asked to be tested, please comply with us and go and participate in these uh, incidents testing, random testing, uh, things that um, you're gonna hear much more from Holly and, and the communications and marketing team, as well as directly from the scientists, uh, Dr. Bonnie LaFleur and Dr. Mike Hammer. They're really out, um, trying to get individuals to participate because it's the only way uh, we're going to be able to mitigate against the spread of this virus. Um, the final thing I would say is, um, you know, we're in search of the 10 second, 10 cent test because then we, everybody would wake up every day. They would do this 10 cent test, uh, get instant results, no laboratory, uh, and then they would know whether they need to stay isolated themselves or whether they are free to go out. The hope is we'll get there. It's going to take us a time, but we, Rich, were looking at a, um, an Abbott test that came out for $5. Um, you know, my, my response to you was, well, the last Abbott test didn't work so well. So we got to make sure they're right. validated, accurate tests because we can't have false positives or false negatives in giving people uh, bad information. The final thing before the, the questions, Holly, is I want everyone to know next week, starting Monday, we'll continue in the mode of delivery we are now. Only those students who have the essential courses will be going face-to-face -face because we need a couple of weeks to find out how our protocols are going uh, getting people back on campus, letting the incubation period run to find out if we're going to have the really big spikes, the one, two, 300 cases a day type of activity, which I'm fully expecting we'll get to if we don't follow the rules. So let's go to the questions. Ah, great. Well, thank you. The first question comes from uh, Tim Eden from KVOA, and he wants to know, um, Oh, give me, oh, where to go, sorry. Um, he wants to know, um, what is the mask policy? What is the mask policy? We are, we're aware of what that is indoors, but what does the mask policy look like for outside? And why do you think so many people are not wearing them? And what is being done to make sure that students mask up? Yeah, so inside any building at the university, it's mandatory you put a face covering on. If you don't, people will come to you and say, oh, you must have forgotten your you know, face covering in your dorm or in your car. We just happen to have an X one. And most people I say, oh, you're right, I did. Thank you, because I really wanted to comply. If, if people don't do that, then um, they're given warnings. And if they persist, uh, um, because I've heard there are um, medical reasons, religious reasons, uh, uh, freedom reasons. But the fact is, it's mandatory if you're inside a building. Outside, uh, it's mandatory if you can't maintain appropriate social distancing, uh, physical distancing. Now, um, the, the question is, why aren't people doing it? Because outside, you know, it's gets a little hot and people, it's sort of a pain, you forget about it. You wanna be able to talk and people to see your expression and all the things. And we understand that, but this is a public health <laughs> crisis. And it's a simple thing, just 
put your face covering on. Uh, the, the data that I was sharing about the hairdressers, I think that's so powerful because even if you're positive uh, and you're not socially distanced, which there are gonna be times when it's just not possible, but if you have your face covered, then the transmissibility would be low. So that's the, uh, that's the policy, unless Rich, I missed something. No, you got it, 100%, right on, Bobby, thanks. Okay, Holly, what's next? KOLD, they say, I know you touched on the struggle to encourage students to practice responsible practices while off campus, but I wanna specifically address the concerns at student housing high rises and complexes surrounding campus. Many are pretty full and it doesn't sound like that there are any plans for testing or isolation if someone becomes sick. Has or will the university step in at any point in guidance or direction when it comes to dealing with the hundreds of students living in these high rises? Yeah, we, we're working with uh, landlords across the city, but particularly in the high rises. And that's, you know, that uh, the fraternity sorority houses where we don't have, uh, I mean, that's the beauty if, if students choose to live in our dorms, we get to set the rules. It's like when children uh, move back to their parents' house, well, we know you've been at college or we know you've been living on your own in Manhattan or wherever you've been, but when you come back to my house, you gotta go by my rules, right? That doesn't usually work out so well, but there's a balance. We, we can't go over and demand that uh, the landlords of the high rises or whatever it is, even our own fraternity sorority has, we've got a little more leverage on the fraternity and sorority houses because they're, they're organizations affiliated with the university. But we obviously working very hard with uh, the landlords to try to encourage our students and the students are getting it because we're pushing it out to them. I mean, we say the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and people just choose not to comply or believe us or, um, you know, they're just, uh, they, they may think that they feel fine and they're young and invincible and they don't have to follow the rules. I mean, you know, that's, that's uh, part of the, the story there. But I'm worried about the high rises. My my sense is people have told me they uh, they've been to the pools there, and there are lots of people close together. They are outdoors, but they're not physically distanced and not covering their face. So we're going to see if that persists. We're going to see uh, spike in cases. You can absolutely guarantee it, Bobby. I think that. Um... In addition, as you know, uh, with various various parts of our ICS team, including the ambassadors, we have reached out to many of these uh, places where our students live, including high rises, because we know there's an increased risk. As as the mayor pointed out, and the county manager, when we spoke, we we understand. But as you said, we don't really have authority there other than the the authority of persuasion, and so our uh, folks have offered signage. We've offered to uh, you know, provide them any information and hopefully we get them to comply. But we are concerned just like the elected officials are concerned that that is a, a part that uh, we have limited control, but we're doing our best to influence the behaviors there through those landlords, managers, et, et cetera. And it's, it's, I think we're doing the best that we can do to try and influence that behavior. Yeah, I even think, uh, and I, I don't want, I can't confirm this, but I know that Chris Kopech and uh, Dr. Ian Pepper were talking about the possibility of doing uh, wastewater-based epidemiology in the high rises. I don't think that's come to pass because we're keeping Dr. Pepper pretty busy on campus, but that's another potential tool that one could use. Can I add two th quick things, President Robbins? I think it's also worth noting that we do have an off-campus uh, strike force that through our government relations uh, office here that are partnering with our communities and our neighbors. And we've uh, just instituted a program where we have, we've gone through the neighborhoods surrounding the campus, hanging up over 3000 door hangers, alerting our neighbors and our community to please contact us if there's any concern of off-campus behavior. 
and they've really, they're partnering with um, TUPD, UPD, UAPD um, to try to get a handle on what we're doing off campus. The other thing that I would say is really important for our uh, community to know is that any of these students living off campus have access to testing here at the U of A. And that testing is ongoing now at both North Rec Center and at McHale. And it's an easy thing to do just to sign up on our website. As you mentioned earlier, it's a five minute run through one of those centers and within an hour they have a test, um, test results to know what they are doing. And if they're symptomatic, they can call Campus Health at any time. Um, and come in and get an antigen and a PCR test. Hey, yeah. one, one, more, one more point that uh, Bobby had brought up, uh, Greek life. And uh, I just wanted to compliment the, the, the deans as well as the some of the leadership. Uh, we've engaged them over time, but we had a very good meeting this week. And I was very impressed at um, the, the self-imposed restrictions they have placed on their members in Greek life by saying this activity is unacceptable. So basically carrying the message that the president has about social distancing, washing your hands and so on, you know, they're, they're setting the standards high out there too. Now I know they don't speak for all Greek life, but certainly the ones that were there and it was a good representation of the leadership, of course, and our leadership on campus interfaces with them. I was very pleased with what they were doing on their own as well. Muted. <laughs> Darn it, today's my day, President Robbins. Uh, our, our next question comes from Charles Fishman at The Atlantic. Charlie. Uh, good morning, guys. Um, two questions. Um, can you give us a little more detail on the wastewater testing at um, Lichens? That, that sounds kind of like dramatic news. Was, the, was this part of the routine we do 12 or, or, or whatever it is a week? How, when you say we tested everybody in the dorm, how many people were living there? Were, were those quick tests? Um, and, and exactly the same thing. You guys have now been in class four and a half days. What's happening there? Any, any, I mean, there are not many universities in the whole country running in person classes of any kind. Tell us a little bit of what. If, if, if I, any of you all have been to those classes, what's going on? Ha, has anybody retreated and said, you know what, this isn't working? T tell us, so, so those two things, a little more color on both those kind of significant events. Yeah, so Charles, um, uh, the wastewater, we, we test all of the uh, dormitories on campus, Dr. Pepper tests them. Uh, they were all negative. Uh, um, also student union and uh, other uh, administrative and lab buildings. Um, so then uh, I think it was Tuesday night, the days run together. Uh, we, he saw, saw an increased uh, uh, viral load coming out of the wastewater of this one particular dorm. Um, and so uh, we did test, uh, I think there are 311 individuals in that dorm and we did the antigen test. We did it all yesterday uh, and found two positive cases um, there. So we're, we're running down contact tracing uh, their contacts and those two individuals have, have gone to isolation. Um, yesterday morning, uh, you know, because we, it's, it's new technology. I mean, it's been used for, I think Ian has been around the world using it to monitor polio and he's been monitoring um, county uh, sewage treatment plants around the country. Uh, but to take it from that large scale down to uh, using it in dorms it is novel and it is a big deal, Charles. Um, but we wanted to make sure that, you know, his one test uh, was accurate. So yesterday morning, he went out and did five additional tests and do, does PCR and does it pretty rapidly. So by five o'clock, all five of them were positive. Um, so we knew we were on something and all the other dorms yesterday were negative. So this is a really, really sensitive test. And Rich, uh, you know, we may need to have uh, Dr. Pepper come on as a, as a guest speaker here on the uh, on the program uh, at some point in the future. 
And then the second question you had, Charles, was about, uh, yeah, classes are going. But remember, these are classes that are, uh, you know, my favorite, organic chemistry or mechanical engineering or physics labs or, you know, we've been doing uh, gross anatomy and things like that uh, since back in July. Because remember, we'd had 7,000 individuals on campus um, throughout the summer with less than 100 cases. We're going to see more cases now because we've got more students back and we've got um, more uh, individuals living off campus and having access to these parties and large social gatherings. But uh, Charles, so far we're three and a half days in, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, days, Thursday, half day oh. into it. And uh, uh, the classes, as I understand it, are going well. The uh, online uh, classes, uh, seems to be better uh, service than uh, was than we had in the spring. So three and a half days in, okay. But um, you know we're gonna we're gonna go slowly. We're gonna watch, um, and if anything changes, we will change because there there are about five thousand students who have some form of essential course, and I've talked to so many students who have that. One course that's face to face, but the rest of the time they're online. Okay, thank you. If anybody else would like to ask a question, please make sure you raise your hand in the uh, in the chat window. The next question kind of follows up on that, uh, President Robbins. Could you? Ex it comes from KOLD. Could you expand on the periodic testing? Will you rely on the data from Dr. Pepper to determine when and where to test, or will you test at random? Yeah, uh, Holly, isn't there? Uh, well, you, I think Bonnie and Mike Hammer, Bonnie Lafleur and Mike Hammer, we're going to have a uh, webinar. We need to, we need to hype that here, and you know, uh, tell people about what they're going to talk about. But that's incidence testing. It's random testing that'll be done across campus. We're targeting about 800 individuals per week, every uh, week of the term, um, just so that we can try to pick up these asymptomatic cases. That's the, that, that's the big uh, prize we're after is find people before they have symptoms so we can take them out of the general uh, population. Great. I think those are the last questions that we have, gentlemen. Rich, any uh, final thoughts you have? Oh, wait, Holly's oh, here. Holly. Sorry, one more from yeah. Charles Fishman. I think he has a follow-up. Go ahead, Charles. Um, uh, you all said at one point, um, President Robbins and, and Dr. Carmana, that you were gonna, that you were hoping to test everybody every two weeks. And, and I, I'm not quite clear whether you're gonna, are you talking about the, in the dorms? Are you gonna cycle people back? So that's yeah. part, part A and part B is 800 individuals per week in terms of random testing on campus. Is that just people who live in dorms? Is that dorms plus staff? Is that anybody regardless of where they live coming back? Yes, so, so I'll take the B part first, Charles. Uh, uh, and we really do, you know, there's so many incredible people we need to have uh, doing these briefings so we can get that out. Maybe we'll go to daily briefings and we'll have a different person every day giving briefings. Um, but yeah, that's that would be the focus, I think, Charles, because so many people uh, have opted, uh, faculty members, staff, so many people have figured out, well, I can do my job from home. So I'm not coming back to the office and, and we're encouraging you. If you can do your job from home, then stay at home. So many of the professors are uh, have uh, comorbid factors. They've got uh, age issues. They, uh, they're just afraid. They don't wanna come back. We've made accommodations to try to help everybody whose job is not absolutely essential. And I always use the heart transplant surgeon um, you can't do a heart transplant from home. So you either got to do telemedicine or take a leave of absence from the university. But people that can do their work from home are by and large staying at home. Uh, and we want that. We want less density on the campus. 
because the fewer people who come together in large groups, the lower the transmission rate is going to be and the better chance we've got to finish out uh, this term so that people can continue to advance their uh, educational uh, careers. They can get the credits they need. They can graduate. They can get prepared to go out and get a job. And Charles, we're going to be at this all of this year. Uh, and we're going to be like this next year. Now, of course, we hope there be a vaccine, but the, you know, you and I have talked about this uh, many times. The chance of getting a vaccine uh, in the near term uh, or to have a therapeutic in the near term um, is it, just not realistic. I mean, you've got to manufacture, uh, you've got to distribute, and then you've got to administer the vaccine. And, and, and so, you know, my, my big concern is how do we continue in the mode we're in and make it to the Thanksgiving break and then learn and reconvene back in January, of which, by the way, we'll be in regular influenza season. That's another hurdle we have to overcome. I think that's it. Any last words, President Robbins? No, I'm going to give Rich the last word, but I don't think I answered Charles's uh, question uh, about wanting to test everybody every two weeks. I'm not even sure that every two weeks is enough. I'd like to test everybody every day with a 10 second, 10 cent test. We're not quite there, Charles, but we are. We've got a professor in bioengineering that's working on something really, really hot. He's a world expert who, uh, who tests uh, for norovirus on cruise ships. So uh, we'll, ha we'll have more to talk about uh, as his data uh, comes along. But I do think that we need to focus, Charles, on those individuals who come to campus. We want as few people as possible coming to campus, but those people who are involved in delivering uh, these essential courses, teaching them, supporting them, staff that comes on campus to do food services, facilities maintenance, cleanup for COVID spills, uh, or the students that come on campus. I, I would like to test them at least once a week using antigen. And, and I think we're pretty much there. I, I'd like to make that mandatory. Uh, and I, I, I think that's what we're gonna be moving towards. We have, we're not quite there yet. Dr. Carmona. Well, I, I think uh, we're pleased with the progress so far. The, the president has uh, outlined everything very well. And I think in closing, the most important thing is, uh, you know, mask up and bear down. <laughs> well, I agree. Thanks, guys. And thank everyone. Thank you for everyone for joining us today. We'll see you again next week. Thank you. Bye.